So I can pop in. Do you want to answer a couple of fan questions while we wait for Patrick oh, to come sure. back? That's a okay. Good idea. Sure. Yeah. Um, everyone who's um, watching, um, I have your questions still from Crowdcast, so I'm going to go through some of those until we get Patrick back. Um, and the first one is, did you have a lyric that didn't make it into the Broadway recording that was really close to you? Yeah, so many, so many of them. Um, but the one that I think like uh, rises to the top is um, is this lyric that happened in in the song called "Chant Reprise." Um, in the second act, it's, uh, it's a sort of a set piece, and there's a lot of different characters that weigh in. And for many years, it was um, this conversation between Hades and Persephone, and um, Hades had his verse, and then Persephone had this beautiful verse that she would say to him, and it, it evolved like over the years many times, and finally for Broadway, I felt like I had landed on it, and it contained the lines, um, uh, take it from a woman of my age, there is nothing love can't change. Even where the bricks are stacked, love is blooming through the cracks. Even when the light is gone, love is reaching for the sun. It was love that spun the world when I was a young girl. And, uh, and it, I, I just felt like, oh, it had finally arrived at a place where it was like thematically and um, poetically like what I wanted it to be. And then it just, it had to go because our second act was too long. And, it, oh. and that, was, that was a problem that plagued us for years. It was like the second act is longer than the first act and that's kind of a no-no. And there was something about it being like meandering at a time when you really, we felt we needed the whole audience to be leaning forward um, for the for the climax. And that, um, so that was one, one verse that was like, it was expendable in the drama. Um, although I was sad to lose it as a piece of poetry. You know oh. what I love about that lyric is, and what I love about all your lyrics is, well, first of all, I think Broadway has this bizarre, and you bring this up in the book, this bizarre obsession with perfect rhyme. And Agreed. rhyme is obviously an element of prosody, but it is not the only element of prosody. There's all kinds of wor ways words relate to one another, knock up against one another, remind uh, inner rhymes, assonance, consonance, alliteration, all the things you use. But the thing that's most, uh, I think the reason your lyrics are so uh, astonishing to me is the insights in them that uh, I've never been in a musical that had such, where, where you're sitting there and the character says something and you say to yourself, yes, that's exactly right. And that, that's like that lyric you just quoted. Um, there are so many like that. The, did you feel any uh, pressure to, uh, from that kind of uh, Broadway, I gotta, I gotta have all these perfect rhymes or were you just like, fuck it, I'm a songwriter, I'm gonna do it the, my way. Oh man. I mean, it was kind of too late by the time we were, <laughs> we were like heading for Broadway. We had like a show full of slant rhymes, which it's true. I love, I love them. And um, I feel like, yeah, there's a place for a perfect rhyme. It is satisfying, almost like in Shakespeare, right? You're a Shakespeare exactly. uh, a student and teacher yourself. And um, you know, the end of those scenes, it, he has those couplets that will live perfect, you know, but the whole, the whole scene is like, it exists in this place where it doesn't land. It doesn't. It doesn't land, and that's um, that's a feeling you get. And I think you know, you get that feeling also musically from like Joni Mitchell, who uses uh, these yeah, exactly. these unusual chords that they, you don't know where the one is, and that there's something about that suspension that we really crave, as well as craving the the, the resolution. Yeah, I mean, there's something about the the the, the musical theater that is. Sometimes, and I, I love musicals, but it's sometimes about cleverness as opposed to insight. You go, oh, that's a clever rhyme. Like Cole Porter's the, the main example, right? Mm -hmm. You go back and you listen to any of those songs and it's just, it's about one rhyme after another, after another, after another, and they're mm -hmm. each one more clever than the next. But in yours, I have to really lean in and listen because along the way there are the, just these astonishing Insights. You said in the book that it's that that making the musical was like gardening, that you have mm -hmm. to discard a lot of things, but they go back into the earth and nothing is wasted. Is that how you feel? That was, you know, that was kind of the 
the the happy takeaway <laughs> for me from the process of writing this book, which was like, um, you know, Plume uh, asked if I wanted to publish a book of the lyrics as they appear on Broadway. And, um, and I was so sort of uh, honored to think about doing that and the idea of giving these, these lyrics a place as sort of poetry on the page. But I realized that I really wanted to, um, to include all of these old drafts of things. And, um, and then I sort of was like, well, now I got to figure out, now I got to contextualize that by writing notes about how things change. And then suddenly I was writing this whole book. Um, but it was sort of like me uh, doing the kind of therapy with myself, you know, about like what, what happened to all those darlings? Like, where did they go? Yeah. And, and what happened to this, all this time that went into that stuff. And um, I, I, I write this in the book, but a lot of times when I'm when I'm working and I I know other people feel this like you feel like you're banging your head against a wall you're like you're looking for the line you're looking for the thing and and especially with writing a musical it can be very task oriented because it's like you got the director the dramaturg the producers are like this character this is a missing piece of this arc like we need to this is the task is very specific and so as a writer you're not allowed to like just la di da <laughs> follow yeah. the muse wherever she wants to go so it was really like um uh you know banging your head against the wall and and my my feeling was like it's wrong it's wrong it's wrong and then somehow miraculously at some point it's gonna be right yeah. i'll find the right thing but the the metaphor of the gardening for me was like oh the right thing could not exist without these wrong things. I that, love that, that when you said that in book. It's, 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 it's absolutely right about all art. Mm, yeah, it feels so true to me. And, and that any, any lyric I ever wrote um, and anything we ever did, any idea you had in the room, you know, any idea Rachel had, any idea, any collaborator that worked on this show had that, that doesn't end up in what you see and hear on the stage. It's still like in the roots of the piece. It's like in the DNA. And to me, it's the perfect metaphor because I've never, I, I, you know, I've made so many musicals from the bottom up and many of them never made it to the stage, but some of them did and some of them were successful and some wouldn't, weren't. But I've never been in one that seemed to grow so organically. And it mm -hmm. came from what seemed to be a sense of faith on your part that mm -hmm. this was going to go the direction it wanted to go if we had the patience and the love to let it go there. But it was going to be hard work. Did you mm -hmm. feel that way? Yeah, I mean, I think it was also, it was very slow how it, how it evolved, yeah. right? And uh, yeah, big, and the, there was such a learning curve. I mean, it started out, you were doing workshops from way back. I'm trying to remember when the first one you did was. Before, before the off-Broadway productions, probably about six months before. So I remember Amber was pregnant at the time. Yes, with her first, her first yeah. child. <laughs> yeah, with her first child, yeah. exactly. Well, I remember that the, at that time, I think the show was really like a series of songs. And that's kind of what, that's what I knew how to do, because I was, I, I, I was a songwriter. I could write, you know, a three and a half minute song. Um, and I knew what that sort of logic was. But it took, you know, layers and layers of revelation to be like, okay, I guess we could, I guess Hermes could be a narrator and I guess he could actually tell us what's happening in the story. And then there was like... What's amazing is that you never dug in and said, no, we're going to do it this way. I, I've, I've worked with composers mm -hmm. who come from another discipline and they were kind of unwilling to to take the lessons of the Broadway musical and use them in a modern way. They just didn't like musicals, period. And so they, you know, you, you talk about in the book, finding um, Jack Vertel's book um, yeah. about making yeah. Broadway musicals. But by that time, you'd already sort of organically found the I Want song for your heroine. And you'd sort mm -hmm. of organically done the opening number and you'd sort of organically found the curtain raiser of the second act. Um, you, you, in a way, you taught yourself how to write a musical, and then, and then when you read a book about West how to write a musical, it was like, well, we've done that. I I, to, it's not a sale. Uh oh, we're getting some interference. Um, can you still hear me, you guys? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, okay, we had okay, Melissa right, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 
I'm trying to remember where we were one second ago. Um, yes, the, the Fertel book, I loved it. And it and I did read it a little late. I wish I had read it a couple years earlier, but it felt like very validating because it was like, oh, we, we're, we're hitting upon these things uh, just by kind of feeling our way in the dark. And then if something works, it stays. And if it doesn't work, it's not gonna stay. And, and you know what it, it made me feel was like, that book is about writing a commercial Broadway hit. You know, it's about like, what's, right. how do we make a hit? What's the formula for that? And, uh, and that feels very crass and, you know, commercial and conventional, but really like, it's about a storytelling uh, culture that is much older than Broadway, right? That's right. It's like exactly right. And the great, and look at Lin-Manuel in Hamilton. He follows it step by step by step, probably without even knowing he's doing so, but it's the love right. of the archetypal form of storytelling. Speaking of which, you have that in the book, because I think your book is really like a hero's journey, you know, oh. of you sort of teaching yourself this. And for me, one of the biggest arcs in the book of that journey is the transformation of Orpheus. Can you mm. talk about the transformation of Orpheus? Because that was amazing for me to watch as an actor. Mm. In the he completely changed 180 degrees over the course of the years I was with the show. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a big part of the book is about the, the transformation of Orpheus. And he was always for me, I think, the hardest character to write, like in a way, um, <clears throat> Hades, Persephone, Hermes, those characters felt like <clears throat> they were all kind of jaded and like ruined in a way. <laughs> and that somehow felt easier to write that than to write for a character who was, who was truly like an optimist, you know, truly an idealist, a hopeful character, um, a good character. And uh, for me, I always saw Orpheus as someone who had irrational faith, you know, because that's, mythologically who he is if he's like i'm gonna go to the underworld and i'm gonna play a song and try to get my my wife back who has died i mean it's a it's a crazy idea and he does it and um but the way that that came across in a bunch of the writing uh early on it it was sort of muddy and it was as if he, ca he came across very um cocky or like macho or like overconfident in the way that he was like first words out of his mouth were come home with me you know to Eurydice and and it wasn't doing any favors for him as a hero like uh, you know people were not really able to get on board with him I think in my heart I always thought of him as like an underdog like a uh but that wasn't how he came across he came across yeah. as a sort of entitled character well, and, and that and that came across in design and things I remember yes. the first one the sort of James Dean look for him you with the guitars right. came over in the red jacket and then it it just kept changing and adapting and and in collaboration with the acts i'll tell you what i loved about all of that is um you know it's it's kind of um it's an old saw that what happens out of town is the the producers or the the creative team they have a problem and they blame it on the actor and then they fire the actor oh, and wow. what you guys did is you you always had complete faith in your actors in all mm -hmm. of the actors that played Orpheus but you knew okay this is my job I have work to do on this right that, that was absolutely marvelous to watch Ah, uh, ah. Uh, well, yeah, it was such a, it, it was such a beautiful process to work with Reeve for multiple productions and see him evolve in the character also, and to have his insight and his feedback on some stuff. Um, like, uh, yeah, what was it? Oh, right. So we, we were getting feedback about this, this Orpheus yeah. problem, you know, from, from New York Theater Workshop days, like, it was like, who is this guy? He seems unfocused. We're so, we're so much more, uh, into Hades and Persephone, <laughs> just like, you know, partly because you and Amber are magic, you know, magicians. Uh, but also the, the younger couple was, um, was less fully drawn, even though there was a lot of language for them. You know, yeah. you guys, I would say, had maybe less language than them, but still you, you the, the picture was much bolder that you guys yeah, were. Well, there's so much backstory for Hades and Persephone, you know, mm -hmm. and one of the things you did with Orpheus was give more backstory about his mother, about his yeah. relationship with Hermes. And all of a sudden we start to know who he is. Yeah, yeah. So all of this kind of came to a head, this, this Orpheus problem after London, where again, it was like, people were like, who is this guy? Why, why do we want to be on his team? And so we had this emergency meeting. And, and you know, I, I dedicated this book to um, 
team dramaturgy, which is like uh, uh, Rachel Chavkin, the director, Ken Chernelia, the dramaturg, and, and Mara Isaacs, who was weighing in on behalf of the producers. Um, oftentimes when there were sort of check-ins, dramaturgical check-ins with me, it was, that was the team. And, and we met, um, Ken was working for Disney at the time, and we met at the New Amsterdam Theater uh, at, his, at his office, and, and it was like, all right, what are we gonna do? <laughs> yeah. How can we address this Orpheus problem? And, um, and it was tricky because I didn't want Orpheus to be a shy character. Like there's no way for that to happen because he sings wedding song. You know, he's a character who, he's not shy, right? He's, he is bold, but he's bold because he's, he's, he's innocent and he doesn't know any better. You know, it's not that he's so brave to go to the underworld and take on Hades. It's like, he's lot, sort of living in his own world. And that was something I really could, could relate to and, and, felt like, oh, there's a lot of artists who are like that. They're, we love them because they can see the way the world could be, but they sometimes have a hard time living in the world that, that is, living in yeah. the world the way that it is. And yeah. that, that feels like a real, that felt kind of like an archetype of, um, for a certain kind of artist. And Reeve is that guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he embodies it. So, and now, of yeah. course, it seems so right that it seems inevitable but i know that for example when we finished london both reeve and i thought that it was going to move in the other direction we thought mm. it was going to move toward him being more forceful um more of a kind of a a, a revolutionary more of kind of a rock star yeah. and we were both really surprised when we sat down in new york the change from london to new york when all of a sudden he was this this innocent uh complete innocent um, mm. who had a wingman now all of a sudden. And, and, that, yeah. and that raised the stakes because now Hermes can say the things that used to make Orpheus look kind of uh, unattractive. He's the one who can say, you've never met anyone like him. He doesn't, Orpheus no, doesn't have to say that for himself anymore. That was mm -hmm. really a stroke of, uh, it was a master stroke. I was so glad to discover that that could happen because I loved those lines for Orpheus. <laughs> you know, I always, yeah. I loved him saying those lines just poetically, but I realized like dramatically, just, we just didn't want to hear them coming from out of his mouth. So um, yeah, and I'm, and that you guys rolled with the punches so well. I mean, that was not only for Reeve to reimagine that character, but for all of you guys that were, you know, playing with him against him, he was suddenly a whole new, whole oh, new yeah. guy. I mean, he just embraced it. And how, under what pressure, both of you, you know, taking a character that you've then been with for 15 years and completely mm -hmm. changing it under the most high, high pressure circumstances imaginable. Um, mm -hmm. It just goes back to that thing of faith, I guess, of just feeling like we're going the right direction and I'm going mm -hmm. to do this now. Because it worked mm -hmm. in London. That's what we were all saying. And I remember Andre saying mm -hmm. that in rehearsal. It's like, guys, this is working. Don't mess with it too much. We're, mm. We see their eyes at the end. They're bawling their eyes out. This is working. But you guys knew it could work better. Yep. I'm getting a message, Patrick, from Emily <laughs> saying maybe it's time for us to wrap up, which makes me sad because I'm so enjoying just like talking to you. Oh, no, that's great. We can get some questions from people. Uh, yeah. Oh, maybe they're going to show this video, actually. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Hey, everyone. I'm Anais Mitchell. I'm the writer of Hades Town and um, apparently also the writer of this book <laughs> now, um, which is a book called Working on a Song. Um, and it's it's all about the lyrics of Hades Town, this, this musical on Broadway. And um, how they evolved and changed over many, many years um, in productions. And uh, thank you for being here at this um, book launch event. I wanted to um, pre-tape just a bit of a reading of the book um, together with some singing and um, just to give you a little taste of what the book has in it. Um, just FYI, there's like some guys doing some construction outside of where I am. So... I can hear like a circular saw right now, and I hope that when you hear that sound, you'll just think it's um, ambiance, sort of Hades-esque industrial sounds going on in the background. Um, 
Uh, so the song that I thought I would start with is um, is the song "Living It Up on Top," and um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna um, sing for you the version of the of the song that appears on Broadway, and then read you the chapter, which is uh, all of my notes about that song and how it evolved over different um, different productions. Thanks for being with us. <laughs> Okay, so here's the version of Living It Up On Top that you would um, hear on Broadway. And on the road to hell, there was a lot of waiting, mm, waiting, everybody waiting on the train, mm, waiting on the lady, with the, waiting on that train to bring that lady, mm, lady with a suitcase back again. She never early, always waiting, waiting. These days she never stays for long, but good things come to those who wait. Here she comes. Well, it's like he said, I'm an outdoor girl. Yeah, and you're late again. Married to the king of the underworld. She forgot a little thing called spring. Are you wondering where I've been? Yeah, where you been? I'm wondering, been to hell and back again. But like my mama always said, brother, when you're down, you're down. And when you're up, you're up. If you ain't six feet underground, you're living it up on top. Let's not talk about hard times. Pour the wine, it's summertime. And right now we're living it. How are we living it? Living it, living it up. Brother, right here we're living it. Where are we living it? Living it up on top. Who makes the summer sunshine bright? That's right, Persephone. Who makes the fruit of the vine get ripe? Persephone. That's me. Who makes the flowers bloom again in spite of her man? You do. Who is doing the best she can? Persephone. That's who. Now some may say the weather ain't the way it used to be. But let me tell you something that my mama said to me. You take what you can get and you make the most of it. So right now we're living it. How are we living it? Living it, living it up. Brother, right here we're living it. Where are we living it? Living it up on top. It was summertime on the road to hell. Mm -hmm. There was a girl who would always run away. You might say that it was in spite of herself mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that this young girl decided to stay. There was a poor boy with a liar who says times are hard. The flowers bloomed, the fruit got ripe, and brother for a moment there. Anybody want a drink? The world came back to life. Up on top, we ain't got much, but we living it, living it up, just enough to fill our cups, living it up on top. Brother, pass that bottle around, cause we living it, living it up, let the poet bless this round. To the patroness of all of this, Persephone, here, here. Uh, who has finally returned to us with wine enough to share. Um, asking nothing in return, except that we should live and learn to live as brothers in this life, and the trust she will provide. And if no one takes too much, there will always be enough. She will always fill our cups, and we will always raise them up to the world we dream about and the one we live in now. Cause right now we're living it. How are we living it? Living it, living it up. Brother, right here we're living it. Where are we living it? Listen here, I'll tell you we're living it up on top, up on top. Living it up and we ain't gonna stop. Living it, living it, living it. So there's a reason why it's um, it, it's hard for me sometimes to remember the lyrics that we landed on for Broadway because there's all these alternate versions of the song. And um, so I'm going to get into that here. I'm going to read some of these notes on living it up on top. So this is the off Broadway chapter. 
We had done one or two residencies and workshops with New York Theater Workshop when Rachel, Mara, and I sat down to dinner with its artistic director, Jim Nicola. He was running late to the restaurant, and I'd had a certain amount of wine on an empty stomach before he arrived. We were all really hoping Jim would say he was ready to give us a production, but his headline was, the show's not ready. He gave all kinds of intelligent feedback that I probably couldn't hear at the time, but the really tough blow was, in his opinion, the show was missing a first act. We had a mindless industrial world below and an apocalyptic world of poverty above, but there wasn't a lot of indication of the joy of the above ground world. There wasn't a lot for the audience to imagine the lovers walking back to in their final ascent. My frustration was peaking with the wine and Rachel asked if I should take a walk to the ladies room. <laughs> I hotly protested the idea that we were missing an act, but I said I would maybe write one or two more songs that could paint a picture of a season of joyful togetherness for our young lovers above ground. Those songs turned out to be Living It Up On Top and All I've Ever Known. I took a few stabs at the season of love, Rent again, I speak about Rent a couple times in this book, with different musical accompaniment. One attempt which never even made it into a workshop was meant to encompass the stories of Persephone and Eurydice in tandem. It went like this. Persephone, a hundred sunny summer days till my lover comes to find me, a hundred blooming olive trees and a hundred grapevines climbing, singing songs when the sun goes down, light the fire in the darkness. Brother, pass that bottle around and we'll raise a glass to the harvest. It's just enough fruit for the pressing, just enough wine to fill our cups, but what we have is a blessing. It isn't much, but it's enough. Mm -hmm. Eurydice, a hundred starry summer nights since my lover came and found me, picking fruit and hopping freights with his music all around me. Stay up late, making love. All the stars are naked, talking sweet and sleeping rough. Our bed is where we make it. It's just enough fruit for the pressing. The whole endeavor felt not in the moment enough for the dramatic world I was suddenly getting a crash course in. It also became clear that the two women needed separate songs and that pacing wise, we needed more time to feel a progression from, as Louis Armstrong sings, the bright blessed day to the dark sacred night. But many images from that early attempt found a home in the song that became Living It Up On Top. Persephone's off-Broadway text went, and I'm gonna sing this for you. Well, it's like he said, I'm an outdoor girl, living it, living it up. Married to the king of the underworld, living it up on top. Trying to enjoy myself, living it, living it up. Six months out of every 12, living it up on top. When the sun is high, brother, so am I, drinking dandelion wine. Well, I'm as free as a honeybee in a summertime frame of mind. When my man comes around, oh, I know he's going to bring me down. But for now, I'm living it. How are we living it? Living it, living it up. Brother, right here, we're living it. Where are we living it? Living it up on top. I remember it was important to me at the time that the first Persephone verse feel yellow rather than red, the sun, the dandelion, the honeybee. This was an instinct I couldn't explain, but it may have been an attempt to indicate the early as well as the late stages of spring and summer, a gradual ripening. Living it up on top always carried with it a sense of montage, as if the scene con constituted both one day and night and a hundred days and nights. Our Orpheus in those days was a bold counterculturalist, and in the second verse, he launched in with his worldview. Hope I can remember it. Now, why would a man of his own free will, he's talking about your man, go to work all day in the mine and the mill? You think I give a damn? Why would he trade the sunshine? Tell him how it is, brother. For a couple of nickels and dimes, up on top, a man can breathe. While he's living it, living it up, picking fruit in the orchard trees, living it up on top. Uh, no one here is a millionaire, but we're living it, living it up. What we have, we have to share, living it up on top. I 
think that's a, oh yeah, oh yeah. And then it goes, brother, give me a liar and a campfire and an open field at night. Give me the sky that you can't buy or sell at any price. And I'll give you a song for free. Cause that's how life ought to be. And that's how I'm living it. How are you living it? The Orpheus verse was followed by a narrative Hermes interlude, which underwent many rewrites, but always served the same function to indicate the passage of time and to launch the dance break. Then came the final Persephone verse and the Orpheus toast, which appeared in many forms, but came full circle. The Broadway and off-Broadway versions are quite similar. I did make one controversial change to the culmination of Orpheus's toast. At New York Theater Workshop, Damon Dono as Orpheus declared all in one breath, let the world we dream about be the one we live in now. Even back then, I was leaning toward the version of the line that has appeared in every other production, to the world we dream about and the one we live in now. I tried to push the change through in previews, but by the time I suggested it, a lot of people were attached to the simple, breathless phrasing of the old line. To me, the new line spoke more genuinely, less like a hallmark phrase and was important to the darkening of living it up on top which became a project over the next few productions but there are two camps here and strong feelings i've seen one or the other version of the toast tattooed on people's bodies this is the chapter called edmonton i started trying to temper the joyful togetherness of living it up right after new york theater workshop for two reasons one the song felt thematically and emotionally abrupt I wanted to maintain an above ground world of hardship that we could forgive Eurydice for wanting to escape. And suddenly Persephone arrived and everyone was having a great party without a care in the world. Two, I fell out of love with my off-Broadway rhyme scheme. That sing-songy patterned internal rhyming in the verses like, I'm as free as a honeybee, started to feel too sunny and music theaterish to me, too yellow maybe. I wanted the whole song a few clicks darker. There was no epic one in Edmonton, so we had to bridge the gap between wedding song and living it up some other way. This was the first incarnation of the Hermes intro to living it up, what eventually became, and on the road to hell, there was a lot of waiting. Hermes, well, the boy said spring was on the, was on the way, Orpheus, any day, Hermes, but it seemed like this year she was late, Orpheus, just wait. Hermes, it's a long way from the underworld, and her train had been delayed by her husband, Mr. Hades, who will get you down the line, because he does not care for the open air or the glare of the sunshine. And when you see that train coming, she is brighter than the sun. Shield your eyes now, brother. Here she comes. Well, it's like he said. The rest of the song was similar to the off-Broadway version, but in Edmonton, the narrative Hermes interlude foregrounded our newly embodied workers chorus. Hermes, and that is how the summer went. Persephone, oh, I'm just getting started. Hermes, the grape got heavy on the vine. Persephone, who says times are hard? Hermes, and the workers brought the harvest in. Persephone, anybody want a drink? Hermes, and turned it into wine. This launched a joyful, much expanded choreographic breakdown from choreographer David Newman. The dance stayed, the grapes did not. This is the chapter called London. In every version of the song before Broadway, Persephone came out swinging with her first verse and chorus and the second verse belonged to Orpheus. But I struggled mightily to write a verse for him that felt authentic. I remember miserably hunting for a new Orpheus verse in my little flat in London. At the National Theatre only, he sang, Up on top times might be hard, but we're living it, living it up, cause we got our beating hearts, and we're living it up on top. We got breath inside our lungs, and we're living it, living it up, gonna spend it singing songs, living it up on top. Brother, we're gonna sing together, gonna let the music play. We're gonna get this band to blow the hard times all away. Because the winter days were long, but this summer night is young, and right now we're living it. Broadway. 
In the course of the big Orpheus shift between London and Broadway, I realized that perhaps the reason it had been so hard to write believable material for him and living it up on top was that it was out of character for him to sing in that number unbidden. He felt much more welcome once he'd been called upon to deliver the toast. For Broadway, I replaced the Orpheus verse with another Persephone verse. Who makes a summer sunshine bright? That's right, Persephone. And the song became a full-on diva number for Amber Gray. I was still exploring language for Orpheus's final toast to Persephone, though. I'd written a darker toast for London so that instead of blithe gratitude for the sunshine and the fruit of the vine she gives us every year, he indicated that all was not as it should be. May she stay a while this time. For Broadway, I went even further with the idea. Orpheus, to the patroness of all of this, Persephone, here, here, who has finally returned to us with wine enough to share. So let no one go without. Let us pour the last drop out in every cup, in every hand. So if hard times come again, then we can all recall the taste of this wine, this time and place, and the way that it tastes better when we drink of it together. And if no one takes too much, etc. I really loved that language, but the fact was it was too long. Producer Tom Curtis, said so very simply at a post-production meeting at Hurley's Saloon on 48th Street, and he was right. So the Orpheus toast came full circle. The text on Broadway is very similar to what audiences heard off-Broadway in 2016. Hey, still there, Patrick? <laughs> that was so was weird to watch moment. myself do it's that, fabulous. and then I didn't realize... I was like drinking wine and then someone commented, I'm like, oh, I'm still on screen. I didn't really realize that. <laughs> um, oh, no, that was wonderful. It's like being inside the process, which is what the book is like, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, uh, the book is so generous, I think. Um, and for me, it's, you know, if, it's, if it was written only for songwriters, then it's written for a dozen people maybe, <laughs> but it's not, <laughs> it's, it's a book about art. It's a book huh. about, and, and it's a book about life and, and patience and perseverance and faith. And, um, and I'm, I just feel so honored that I got to be there for all of that. I guess we're okay. going to take uh, questions from the chat. Is that right, Andrea? Yes, it is. Um, we have, just so everyone knows, we have like 70 questions. <laughs> We're probably not going to get through all of them, um, but a lot have been answered just between you two talking and through the video itself. Um, so that was really cool. Um, I've gathered your questions from the chat and from Crowdcast. Um, so let's dive in and get to as many as we can in the short time we have together. Um, the first one um, is Anais, are you looking to do another piece of musical theater? Or did it just so happen that it was the best medium for telling the story of Hades Town. Mm. Well, having done one, it's hard to picture not doing another someday. You know, it was just like so beautiful. And I wanted to say this about Patrick. Like, uh, Patrick, you you were um, you were along for that whole ride, and you're also like the reason that the piece is what it is. You know, it's you you're all of the actors and but especially someone like you who was with the show for many productions like um, I've learned so much from you and I want to say thank you for um, letting me be on your ride also <laughs> um, and uh, so the, the short answer is I'm kind of following my bliss right now just writing some song regular old songs and um, folk music but someday I hope to get back in there with team dramaturgy <laughs> absolutely we're all waiting. <laughs> no rush. <laughs> um, and then, um, Patrick, there's a question for you, kind of related. What made you feel like Hades was a character you wanted to portray? Well, initially, it was the music. I, I, I saw a, an ad in either Playbill or Backstage that said they were looking for this character, Hades, Lord of the Underworld, and that he might be looking for a base, and nobody's ever looking for a base. Hmm. So I immediately... Uh, and, and I saw it was being directed by Rachel Chavkin and I had just seen Great Comet. So I was like, okay, I got to find out what this is. And sure enough, I went to iTunes, pulled it up and there were, I could hear it because the concept album was available. 
So I bought the two songs. I bought Hey Little Songbird and Why We Build the Wall that were Hades. And I listened to them and I was like, well, I have to sing this. I have to. I, I'm, it's done, done. I'm going to sing these songs. So I, I called my agent and said, could you please tell them that I'd love to come in and audition or meet them, whatever they'd like. And uh, I, I, I would love to be a part of this in any way I can. That's, that makes sense. The music pulls a lot of us in. <laughs> um, a question, another question for Anais um, from Kara. Did you have anyone in mind for casting while you were writing the music? Mm. Um, well, it changed, you know, it changed over the years. Like at first I was thinking about my friends in Vermont that were going to play the characters and then started working on the album. And I was like, wow, Justin Vernon is going to sing this part. You know, Annie DeFranco is going to sing this part. I, I, I wanted to write for them. And then once I was working in New York, um, there were folks like Patrick and, and, and Reeve and, and Eva and, you know, uh, Amber, everyone. Um, uh, and there's nothing like it, nothing like seeing an actor, hearing an actor and seeing them really sink their teeth into a lyric. It's like very inspiring. Awesome. And um, then, sorry, I just lost my place here. Okay, were there any other Greek mythological figures you almost included in Hades Town, or that had to be removed? Particularly interesting are the lyrics that seem to reference Mother Nature, like Demeter, or previous lyrics from London, like Brothers Betrayed, Zeus or Poseidon. And that's from Sherry. That's such a good question. Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting that Demeter does kind of show up a lot because, um, Persephone's always talking about her mom, right? Let me tell you something that my mama said to me. Um, and, and she is sort of the inextricable part of the story of, of Persephone and Hades. Um, and I guess like Orpheus's mom, kind of, there's a lot of moms, the unseen mom comes into play because um, Orpheus is the son of a muse. Um, there was a moment very early on where I think I thought about Apollo being part of it because in some versions of the myth, Orpheus is the son of Apollo. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's, I, I remember that from something. Because there's a line in a really old song that went, Apollo come down in your cloud machine. So there were, there were I suppose, like some little references to these other gods. But we were kind of um, at, at max capacity for, for gods. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long, this is a new question, how long did it take you to come up with Orpheus's mel melody? It's such an essential fabric of the show, and I was wondering if there was a lot of trial and error with it. I suppose that that person is asking about the epic melody. Um, I think so. Yeah, and like the la la melody that, you know, la 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 la, that that was, came very quickly, came very quickly. And for me, I think that that is a weird thing about my, my processes, like melodies for me come sort of intuitively. And what I spend 95% of my time doing is rewriting the lyrics. Um, so there was an evolution of that melody in London where um, I uh, sort of felt like words were not achieving the thing that we wanted to achieve. And so could it go, could it kind of go to 11 melodically? So I did write some more stuff in London for, for Orpheus's melody, but, um, but the simple chorus was just like very, uh, a very quick thing. So it's, it's what everyone, it's what's there. It's what I think of first. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for Patrick, this is more of a, a experience question with the show um what do you do to help maintain your stamina performing each of the week well uh, it, it, actually the role is beautifully placed so it's it's not a terribly exhausting role as some are you know sometimes people will write a role that is just really impossible to play like max and the producers it's like no one should have to play that eight times a week um, this role is really quite beautifully placed through the show so that I think it probably from the audience looks like he's doing more than I'm, I'm actually doing. I, I don't find this to be a particularly difficult uh, role to maintain. But part of that is that playing opposite Amber, who keeps me very alive. And, but, you know, just on a technical level, I always warm up before the show, before every single show. I warm up physically and vocally. 
And uh, if I don't do that, then I'm, I'm not going to have a good, a good show. Um, and, you know, the regular stuff like trying to drink enough water and get enough sleep. But, but it's, you know, it's, it's a beautifully written part. So it, it's, it's, it, it does a lot of the work for me. Just as the, the, the beautiful work that Michael Crass did on the costume and the hair does so much of the work for me. And Aeneas, people sometimes ask me what it's like to, how do I go about playing a god? And I always say Aeneas already did that work. She said it in this, the, the vocal range in this kind of subterranean way that that carries the god energy. I don't have to do anything. That way she wrote it carries that energy. And another question, did you see for your role, Patrick, um, we talked a lot about Orpheus morphing from like someone who would make maybe come off like too brusque to someone a little more innocent. Did you see a lot of change in Hades as he was developed? The, you know, it, there was almost no change in Hades. I think Aeneas would agree with me. Hades and Persephone, there were some little cuts and trims here and there as the show began to fill out in other ways and we had to look for places to, to tighten. But, um, you know, I, I've, I've said many times and I believe absolutely that why we build the wall is, is, is a perfect song. The circularity of the logic, it, you, you, you couldn't have written that song without knowing where it's going to end. And mm -hmm. Anais has said many times that it's one of the only songs that kind of came to her quickly and as a piece. And so, no, it, 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 he really didn't change. Now my performance of him changed a bit as uh, I learned more and more and more that he was entirely motivated by his love for Persephone and that everything he did was motivated by trying to, to get her back to, to restore their love to the, how it had been in, in, in their youth. And a lot of that was additional lyrics that um, Aeneas had written as she went along. The backstory of Hades in the epics, especially in Epic One, was filled in more. So the audience knows more about Hades and I know more about Hades. But in terms of what Hades does or sings or says, that didn't change a whole lot. We made some, but where it did change, it was really crucial. For example, there's a line at the end that Aeneas changed in London. And uh, I, I, oh, Aeneas, help me remember. It's been yeah, seven. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can remember. So it's in um, uh, his kiss the riot, right? Yeah, where he I go to, to Hermes, and yeah. I say, um, let he them used to go. Say only one thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, let them go. And what was the initial lyric? Oh, but let yeah. their no, let them go. It was quite but let there be. So, so you, you sing, let them go, but let there be some term to be agreed upon, some condition. <laughs> that's, the, that's the line I say now, but what was mm -hmm. the line that I said? What was it before? It used to go, um, only one thing to be done, let them think that they have won. Let them think that they have won. Yeah. Right. And that, and that just felt, I'm, I'm so glad when you brought it up, that it felt... It wasn't what I was trying to do in that moment. I'm actually trying to give the kid a real shot. And if he can do it, then he's the better man. And the other one was let them think that they have won, which was quite Machiavellian and as if I was setting him up for a fall, which is not at all what I was doing. So that kind of little change of lyrics, small, a few syllables, changes the whole scene. And I had a few things like that. And just to piggyback on that and say that, you know, a lot of those changes came because Patrick's, your performance of the character was so, um, so complex. You know, I think I, I had written a more of a two dimensional villain character. And then when you came to the role, um, you started to bring all of this complexity to the character and you could see his insecurities, you could see his vulnerability, and, and there were moments to be able to lean into that lyrically. And, and certainly I learned a lot from you about how, you know, things you were reading into the songs that I hadn't even intended, um, but were completely intuitively spot on. Thanks, yeah, I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, this is the thing about musical theater is it's like complete collaboration. And when you're doing it right, like I was saying with Michael Crass, he had worked out this beautiful design 
But then I had a lot to say about like, I don't think the jacket should be on in the second act. I think the sleeve should be, and I think we should see, I think he should be tattooed. I think he should have bricks on his arm. So I would bring that to it and Michael would then say, okay, well, and then he would make the design, you know? So everybody was collaborating with everybody. Absolutely. We're going to keep on this track for another question and then maybe switch gears a little bit. Um, but for both of you, um, how do you imagine Hades and Persephone's relationship progressing after the show ends? Mm -hmm. What do you oh, think? Oh, that's for you, Patrick. That's for you. <laughs> I, you know, the thing is, they're going to sing it again. And it's going to go the same way up to a point. And I say at the end, and this was a lyric that changed, where I say, um, you know, uh, wait for me, I will. What comes right before that? Um, she mm -hmm. says, are we going to do it again? And I say, I say, um, it's almost spring. I used to, what did I say first? No, I you said, say it's time for spring now. It's time <laughs> for spring, right. But I used to say it's almost spring. And now I say it's time for spring. It seems like such a small thing, but it's enormous. It's, it's Hades acknowledging that there's a natural order to things that he's thrown out of whack. Mm -hmm. And so it would be, you, you could take two syllables and change the character entirely. Absolutely. Um, that's another my, question. That's Paul. Yes, someone. Someone, <laughs> someone else is like on it. Thank you, Marina. And they're gonna try again next fall. And, ho and I have hope, I have faith that eventually it'll work out. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of tying into that, the, the, the circular, 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 you know, I'll say it that way, um, nature of like the wall and of telling the story and how we're going to tell it again. Um, Deanna is asking, was there any ever thought about changing the ending from the original myth to let Orpheus and Eurydice get out together? When I saw it, it seemed like so many audience members genu genuinely believed they would make it. And then piggybacking on that, what is your interpretation of what makes Orpheus turn around? Mm. Who would like to chat, take that question? Well, as far as the first part of that question goes, um, I don't think you can do that. I don't think you're allowed. <laughs> I think you're allowed. Well, you are right? allowed. I mean, think about it. Think about it. I'm so glad you didn't. But, you know, Rent is an unbelievably popular adaptation of La Boheme. And in Rent, Mimi lives. And in La Boheme, Mimi dies. Mm. So that was Jonathan Larson saying, there's something about a musical. And I think what you managed to do is to have your cake and eat it too, um, which is musicals ha have to end on a, a note of hope. They are not tragedies. They, um, they might be comedies, but they're not tragedies. And um, I, I mean, there's, there are exceptions like Sweeney Todd, that's a full on tragedy at the end, mm -hmm. there's no hope, right? But by and large, they, they're hopeful. And, um, and you manage to give us hope with the final song, with the, we're gonna sing it again, we're gonna try again, which to me was a, a, just such a stroke of genius that you allow the myth to be what it is and then say, you know what, we'll try again and see net tomorrow night how it works out. <laughs> I actually forgot the second part of the, of the question. I don't know if we answered it all. Oh, the second part was, and I'm sorry, I don't have the name of who asked this because I grabbed it quickly, but um, what do you interpret is make, makes Orpheus turn around mm -hmm, as they're yeah. coming out of Hades? Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious Patrick's response to that. And, and that was a big question mark for a lot of the development of the show. You know, there are all kinds of reasons why that might happen. Um, you know, partly I, I went deep down one rabbit hole at one point about like, he is abandoned by Eurydice, you know, early in the first act, that is what happens. She leaves him. And so for that fear to come back around when he's, when he's made to walk, um, without her, uh, beside him, um, made a lot of sense. But I remember Andre de Shields saying in a workshop that we did, they felt like the doubt had to be dealt with a capital D, that it had to be deeper than just jealous love, you know? Uh, it had to be, uh, he said, existential and it's inevitable. existential doubt, exactly right. And that's, what, yeah. and that's what Hades sees at the end of, at the end of his Kiss the Riot. 
when he says doubt comes, doubt comes in. And, and the, to me, that's such a sad line. It's a God knowing that, that if, if even I, God of the underworld, have doubt about the love my wife has for me, there's no way this kid is going to make it out. And if he does, he deserves to. Mm -hmm. And, and to go further with that, I think there's something about, there's something in the whole show that's kind of about like, um, Hades and Persephone are this older version of a love story and, and Orpheus and Eurydice are, are the younger version of them at some level. And, there's a way in which um, Orpheus is, you know, he begins as this innocent character. He, he can see how the world could be because he hasn't seen that much of the world in the way that it is. And for me, there's something about, he goes to the underworld and the entire, like he essentially has seen too much, you know, by the time he's walking out, he's seen too much of the way that the world is to actually hold on to that faith that he had when he was innocent and i think that there is we sort of see that at a generational level in politics even you know that young people they come up they can see how it could be they look around they're like this is wrong that's wrong we got to change this and then you know you get older you have do you have to pay the mortgage you have to do these things and you you've seen the way the world is you have a harder time accessing that faith and um so that I suppose is connected to the cyclical and the seasonal, the, the season of youth um, that comes around again and again. And, and uh, I don't know if that's a depressing thought or <laughs> realistic or what. But I think, mis I think mystery is such a, a wonderful part of this, of this piece. And there is mystery in the turning around. That's why we keep telling the story over and over again, because there's, it has enough space in it to, um, to uh, it, it, there could be so many reasons why he turns around and to, and to pinpoint one, I think Andre was exactly right about it. It's doubt with a capital D and we've got the whole song of the fates whispering in his ear. Yeah. You know? And let's face it, she's done it before. She left him once before. That's what Iago says to Othello. You know, she did that to her father. Maybe she'll do it to you. She left him. Maybe she'll leave you. Mm. You know, she lied to her father. Maybe she'll lie to you. I mean, people are insecure. Yeah, definitely. Oh man, this is, I wish we could just keep going and going, um, but we have hit the 8.30 mark and we did even start late. I wanna thank everyone for being super adaptable tonight and for sticking around a little later than we had planned. Um, I hope you felt it was worth it. I know I certainly do. Um, Patrick and Anais, any final uh, thoughts or things you wanna share before we sign off for the night? For me, it's um, just, I can't wait to sing it again. Oh, I've, I've so enjoyed seeing you again, Patrick. <laughs> it's nice Thank to you. hang out. Thank you to The Strand and thank you to Plume Books and thanks to all of you guys who um, stuck with us through the technical stuff. And just to say, hang in there to everyone because this is a hard time for everyone and hang in there. Stamina, 